Hey everyone and welcome to this edition of Come to the Linux Side because we have some cool stuff. And this week we have a giant AI alliance being created by the likes of IBM, Sony, Intel, AMD and a lot more. But also the EU starting to regulate how AI is used and how transparent it can be. We have the beta for Zorin OS 17, we have a major vulnerability that affects mostly every Linux and Windows computer and we have Linux getting the blue screen of death. And we also have this segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Squarespace and you probably have heard about them by now. But if you haven't, just know that they're your all-in-one solution to build your own website, however complex or simple you want it to be. You can completely customize the website to look and feel and have the features that you want. You have a big selection of templates and then you can rearrange them by just dragging and dropping blocks into place. You can change the general colors, you can add new pages and you have a big library of modules like a complete online shop with online payment or a members only area, a video gallery. You can even pick your own domain name and book it from Squarespace and they even have a module to design your own logo. So if you need a website but you don't really know how to get started or you don't have the time or the technical skills, just head over to squarespace.com slash the Linux experiment or click the link in the description below and you'll get 10% off your first purchase. Now Zorin OS 17 beta was released early this week. If you don't know about it, it's a seriously beefed up Ubuntu based distro that uses LTS releases but improves the desktop experience in a lot of ways, including automatic layouts to have an experience closer to what you might know from another desktop or OS and a lot of pre-installed tools. Zorin OS 17 is based on Ubuntu 22.04, but it upgrades it to GNOME 43 instead of GNOME 42. It brings a lot of cool improvements on top of that. The first being a very visual one called the Special Desktop. It's basically the return of the desktop cube with a parallax effect on the windows. And it looks really, really cool, although it might not be a giant usability improvement compared to just a regular strip of desktops. The Alt Tab switcher is also replaced with a 3D switcher and both features can be turned off in the appearance settings if you don't like them. They also use GNOME's horizontal desktop strip in the activities view and they have the touchpad gestures in place to use it properly on a laptop. They improved window tiling as well, with quarter tiling now available, either by dragging windows to corners of the screen or by using keyboard shortcuts. And they have experimental settings to implement tiling layouts. They also get all the new stuff from GNOME that you didn't get in the older versions of Zorin OS, but they also revamped their own menu with better search and they added an all apps category to browse the full list of installed software. They also plan to add two new predefined layouts that let you move to a Chrome OS-like desktop in one click or a GNOME 2 inspired layout if you prefer that. And Zorin OS 17 also reduces the bloat complaints by removing the to-do app, the GNOME maps and the games out of the box. And they also updated the theme to work better with GTK4 and Libadvita apps and it moved to the Linux kernel 6.2, which is not so great as 6.6 .6 is out and it is an LTS and it brings plenty of performance improvements and better drivers. You can already download the beta and give it a shot if you want, but apparently the final release isn't too far away, so maybe you want to wait for that. I will probably have a video covering that on the channel. Now we also have Mint 21.3 just around the corner and as always it's a minor upgrade but it brings some interesting stuff. The first big one is experimental Wayland support. Mint and Cinnamon have started their path towards Wayland and 21.3 will be the first version that lets users test it out. It won't replace X11 yet, but they will start accepting bug reports on a dedicated GitHub repo that will gather all Wayland related problems, whether they're for an application, for Cinnamon, or for the distro itself. Nemo, the file manager, will now support adding actions through a sort of repository letting you install, remove, and rate various actions that appear in the right-click menu, just like you can do with applets, desklets, extensions, and themes. And there are a few other changes, like hypnotics, gaining the ability to favorite channels and to create custom ones, plus a few fixes and improvements to the login screen, the batch renaming tool, and the image and video viewer. 
There doesn't seem to be enough there for a dedicated video, but I might do a Battle of the Beginner Distros video comparing Zorin OS 17 to Mint 21.3 since they should release at around the same time. Now, if, like me, you think that the current AI craze sucks, but that if AI has to exist, then it has to be open, then you might be happy to see that there is now something called the AI Alliance. And it is backed by a lot of big companies, including AMD, Sony, Red Hat, IBM, Oracle, Intel, the Linux Foundation, the University of Berkeley, Dell, Stability AI, CERN, and a lot of others. Their goal is to develop benchmarks and evaluation standards to make sure AI work is coherent with each other and they want to create open models. They want to work on providing AI hardware accelerators and generally just support AI development in the open. It is an international organization and they seem to also want to focus on creating models that have an actual practical use case to solve big issues like climate, education and more. They will create working groups to address each main topic and they'll have a board to establish the main guidelines and standards. And I am sure people will find fault with any or all of these companies and entities that form these and it's probably just a move to make sure that they don't get passed by by the other giants that aren't part of this group like Microsoft, Google or Amazon. But in the end, I would much rather we have a general standards defining body that sort of forces people to work on AI in the open, at least if this AI alliance can manage to reach their goals. And speaking about AI, the EU once again takes the lead in making sure that this hype train doesn't go too far by just writing the AI Act. It's a provisional agreement, which means it still needs to be ratified. But since all member countries already agreed on this draft, it should be considered as good as voted. This law will prevent malicious applications of AI, like using it to violate civil rights in the EU, like predictive policing, using it for facial recognition or to manipulate human behavior. They will also force general purpose AI, like ChatGPT and other chatbots, to be more transparent. They will have to share technical documentation they will have to comply with copyright law in their data sets and they will have to provide detailed summaries of the content that they used to train the AI. And this also applies to the AI models, not just the resultant applications of it. Fines will reach 7% of the revenue of companies that violate these regulations, which is once again very unfortunately low. Still, it is great to see this. AI needs to be regulated and looked at because the impacts it could have on our societies with fake information, with manipulation, with being run by giant companies that have a very bad track record of privacy and how they handle content, it just needs to be regulated. So I'm glad the EU is taking the plunge and I hope other countries will also follow suit. Now this one is pretty fun and it might give ammo to people who think Linux is turning into Windows or whatever other nonsense as Systemd got a new update which specifically brings the ability to display a blue screen of death when the system fails to boot. This new component is called Systemd BSOD for blue screen of death and it will now display emergency log messages in full screen when there's a big failure during the boot sequence so users can better understand the error and it will also provide them with a QR code so they can get more information about the problem to try and fix it. Now, that's not all this update brings though. There's also Storage TM, which is a new component that exposes all storage devices for other computers to access, similar to what macOS provides in target mode. And there's VM Spawn, which is a new tool to spawn virtual machines in the same way as Systemd could spawn containers. It uses QMU and it is still considered experimental for now. Support for System V or System 5 service scripts has also now been deprecated, which means it's no longer officially supported and will be removed in a later version. And I get it, people do not want Linux to turn into Windows, that's normal, I do not want that either. But let's be honest, the blue screen of death was only hated because during a certain period of Windows life, it was something that users were confronted with very, very often. In terms of concept, having a more legible error message with help to try and fix it is much better than being stuck on a black screen with white lines of text that don't tell you at all what went wrong. Now there's an unfortunate new security vulnerability that affects virtually every Windows and Linux user, dubbed LogoFail. 
It's more of a combination of two dozen different flaws that have been there for a long while in UEFI implementations and they're applicable to AMI, Inside and Phoenix, all three being BIOS or UEFI interface providers, but also to Lenovo, Dell, HP and also to CPUs from Intel, AMD and a lot of ARM CPUs as well. The way this thing works is by using the step where the manufacturer displays a logo at boot by replacing that logo with a similar looking one with some malicious code added on top when the system starts up and a bootable image is started. It thus bypasses any sort of system security and it controls the whole disk, the memory and the OS that will be started. This also means that with this set of vulnerabilities, attackers can launch anything they want before the OS even boots and modify anything they want. It can be exploited remotely and it can be started without storing any executable code on the hard drive, meaning that it's very hard to detect that you're currently under attack with an antivirus. And once there's actually something written to the disk, once the logo image has been replaced, even an OS reinstall won't fix the issue unless you also reflash the firmware. So basically, when you get a firmware or UEFI update from your manufacturer, either from LVFS or on Windows, apply it right now. It will fix the problem if you're already infected, and if you're not, it might help with not being infected, which is good. Now we have some cool updates coming to GNOME soon, including one to fix how text and icons scale, especially with the accessibility option that does exactly that. Basically, they added conversion functions to turn pixels and points into EM, and they changed how padding works so it can scale properly. Icons and assets will also now scale alongside the text, and the buttons in the panel will also scale to support these changes. This means that if fractional scaling doesn't work well for you, you can just increase the font size by a factor of 10% or 25% and get what is pretty much the same result in any app that supports that, which should be a bigger subset of apps than the ones that actually do scale well with fractional scaling. On top of that, work is progressing on the new USB portal, on notification grouping in the GNOME shell, and they're also working on better fractional scaling by first analyzing the various constraints and options they have to implement it well. And they're also looking at the state of speech synthesizers on Linux to improve accessibility. Finally, it looks like triple buffering is ready to be merged. It's something that should improve the performance of GNOME on integrated graphics and that Ubuntu already added themselves. But it looks like it's finally ready to be added to GNOME as a whole for GNOME 46 maybe. This font scaling thing might be a bigger deal than it looks because it means that you don't really need fractional scaling if all you're using is a laptop with a much too high resolution for the size of the display. You can just scale the text and everything will be scaled elegantly and you won't use more power, you won't have any blurriness. It's probably a better way of solving the issue than fractional scaling which is much harder to implement and a lot of apps don't really follow well. And triple buffering of course is a godsend for people who have older integrated GPUs. Interestingly, KD also implemented something just like that called DMA Fence Deadline, which should help with Intel integrated GPUs on Wayland to have a much smoother experience. And let's finish this with the gaming news. First, we have an interesting look at the performance and power consumption of the Steam Deck OLED, if you were wondering if it was worth the upgrade. In terms of performance, don't expect a difference. You will be able to grab a few FPS here and there, but it will not push a 30 FPS game into 40 FPS territory or a 40 FPS game to 60. And that's a good thing to avoid the older LCD deck being abandoned by developers. But in terms of battery life, you're gaining one to four hours depending on what you're playing. And that's paired with a better display, a better refresh rate and improved inputs as well. So while I will not be upgrading personally because I don't play enough on my Steam Deck anymore to justify the expense, if you already have a Steam Deck but you wish you had better battery life, then the OLED might be a good choice. And if you don't have a Steam Deck, there is no doubt, go for the OLED, don't buy the LCD. The OLED looks like it's a much, much better deal. And we have yet another wine release, 8.22, which adds even more Wayland support. This one adds mouse lock support and relative motion events, which means that now first person shooters and other games like that should be able to work properly when using the Wayland backend of wine. 
This should basically implement everything that is needed for a fully working experience, apart of course from some specific bugs and performance issues. So that's pretty freaking nice. It means that we'll probably see Wine fully working natively on Wayland in 2024, which probably also means that Proton will follow suit relatively soon after that, and this will mean better performance for every gamer on Linux, whether you are using XWayland or X11, native Wayland gaming will definitely provide better performance. And today's sponsor will also provide you with a better computer to run Linux. If your computer is due for a replacement, whether it's a laptop, a desktop, or a NUC, and you plan to run Linux on it, stop looking at devices that only support Windows officially. Buy something from our sponsor, Tuxedo. They provide computers that ship with Linux pre-installed. All the hardware has been picked specifically because it works well with Linux. And if they encountered any issues during their testing or before shipping the computer, they actually submit patches upstream to fix those problems for everyone. They have a big range of computers that should fit basically every need and every price point. Every device is very customizable up to the keyboard layout, your own logo and the components inside and all the laptops can be opened, repaired and upgraded. So if you need a new computer, click the link in the description below. All I use nowadays are computers from Tuxedo for editing all these videos, for working, for my billing, for my invoicing, for running this channel and also for gaming as my SteamOS console is a computer from Tuxedo as well. So click the link in the description below and get started with a real Linux computer. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications or to write a comment. And if you didn't, there's always that thumbs down button and the comment section below. And if you want to support the channel, there are plenty of links in the description of the video for Libra Pay, PayPal, Patreon, YouTube memberships, whatever, you know how this works. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.